there and welcome to my channel. If this is your first time here, my name is Angie and I'm a chemist who loves makeup. So today we're going to be talking about something that the brand Good Molecules did recently. They're very similar to The Ordinary if you haven't heard of them before. So recently they rolled out with what they called their nothing to hide ingredients list as a form of transparency. So we're going to go through what this list consists of and what my thoughts on it are, if it's actually helpful for the customers or more performative in a way to give the idea that they are being transparent. So this has all the ingredients listed from most concentrated to least concentrated as is very standard, but it has all of the percentages associated with each ingredient. So basically they gave you the breakdown of the whole formula. And they also have what they call their release notes and the version number in this case for the serum, it's 1.1. And they tell you specifically what they swapped out in terms of ingredients, what they took out, if they added anything. So what does this actually mean for the customer? I don't think very much in my opinion. I don't think it does you a lot of good to know that there's 5% butylene glycol, 5% glycerin, 0.8% of the gums. The only thing possibly is that the actives, in this case it's 4% niacinamide and 2% cetyl transeximate misylate. Even that requires marketing from the brand to tell you what this means. For instance, I never heard of cetyl transeximate mesylate before, so to tell me it has 2% gives me no context, does not tell me anything. In terms of marketing, they still have to tell me what it does, but I also don't know at this percentage that it's effective. I had to go look it up to see if it was truly effective. So there is some kind of marketing that is still required when telling me about an ingredient, being which doesn't really seem useful because I'm not gonna know that based on seeing it. So it doesn't seem any more helpful than a regular ingredients list in that aspect. And also, I think this could also not be that good because it may seem to the customer like they're getting ripped off in a way. For instance, in this one, they're 77% water. Because it's mostly water, people might think they're paying a lot of money for something that is 77% water. Because of the nature of a product like a toner or a serum, they are going to be more water-based. Something like a moisturizer is going to have significantly less water. Or if you were to formulate with something other than water that could have a similar texture, then that seems like people are getting more for their money, if that makes sense. Also, these percentages can be a problem as well because more is not necessarily better. Increasing concentrations of some of these skincare actives may not actually benefit the skin at higher concentrations and may actually lead to irritation. That's why, as you can even see on this list, the preservatives are so low because that's the lowest number that they can have the preservatives at, which A, saves the company money to have less of the preservative, and B, prevents irritation. So they're gonna use the least amount they can and that still protects the formula. So for instance, this is a serum. So you only use a little bit of the product. So if it's at a higher concentration, it's not as bad because you're using so much less of the product. Now, if we think of a moisturizer, which you're going to use a lot more of, if it has the same percentage of ingredient, it could lead to irritation on your face because you're distributing total amount of that ingredient much more on your face. In the case of a rinse off product, it's not going to be on there very long. So if you do have a higher percentage, it may not even be on there long enough anyways to do anything. Just knowing these percentages doesn't necessarily help. You have to look at things like studies maybe. For instance, the cetyl transeximate mesylate at 2% in a serum is beneficial, but that doesn't mean it's gonna necessarily translate to it's effective in a moisturizer, it's effective in a face wash. Also, like I said, I don't know at what extent this is gonna be used on their packaging for their products, but I would love to see what the list is on something like a moisturizer because serums are very, very simple. It's water, something to thicken it up, and your actives. Very, very minimal in that case. So your exposed ingredients list 
really isn't that exposed. It'd be more interesting to see something like a moisturizer, something that might have actives that aren't at high concentrations and see them share that. But really, that's really only interesting for me to kind of understand at what concentrations things are used at. This brand as a whole is very minimalistic, much like The Ordinary, where they would use less ingredients because it makes it cheaper. So they're not gonna be like some of these other brands that put five or 10 extracts in there. So you're not really exposing anything. You're exposing something that wasn't, didn't really need to be exposed in the first place. And also this list only shares what they put in initially. This doesn't tell you how stable it is over time, but for OTC products such as a sunscreen, if you state you have 10% of an ingredient throughout the duration of its shelf life, you have to prove that it contains that amount within a certain percentage. In the instance of good molecules, they have a brightening serum that has vitamin C. Vitamin C is very, very unstable, especially in aqueous solutions, in water-based solutions, which the serum is gonna be. So maybe you get this brightening serum and you get it when it's after three months of being made with manufacturing, getting to the distributor, all that stuff. And maybe you use it over the course of three to six months. Well, maybe at the end of that six to nine months, there's not much vitamin C, so that vitamin C isn't doing much for you, but on the packaging, this was one of the highlighted ingredients on the packaging, and one of the ingredients that's gonna help your skin. So these lists don't tell you how stable the ingredients are either. And I thought it was interesting on the packaging, I'm gonna read for you what it says underneath this list. It says this product contains natural ingredients that may vary in viscosity and will not affect the overall efficacy. So I believe what they're referring to in this case is the gums in there. So the gums are what's gonna be used to thicken it, what's gonna help adjust the viscosity. So I have to wonder if they were complaining between lot numbers that people had, if there was a significant vary in viscosity. Um, I don't think, I, I would be surprised if that was a really big concern, especially for a serum, how thick it was, but maybe there were some complaints and that's why they felt the need to put it. They also put the disclaimer, the ingredient percentages in P8 represent nominal targets, which some with some variability is expected, but that doesn't tell you what the variability is. That doesn't tell you how much variability that there could be. If it's very tight, like 10%, for instance, the cetyl transeximate mesylate could be 1.8% is 1.8% effective, maybe a little more. Usually I think they try to aim a little higher. Tell you, oh yeah, it can vary, but you don't tell us how much it can vary, so that's a very vague statement as well. So let's talk about these release notes. So them putting what they changed in the formula, a lot of people would probably think is very good, and I kind of have mixed feelings on it. I remember with the Jaclyn Hill palette, they changed the formula and people didn't know, so people were still buying it based on previous recommendations. And I kind of have mixed feelings on that. I don't believe that companies should have to tell you every time they change a product because that's just very unrealistic. I think there are ways that you can circumnavigate. I don't believe that companies should have to disclose when products change, unless maybe it's a major thing that it's no longer vegan or something, something of that nature. I could see, I could see the reasoning behind it, but in general, I don't think there's really a necessity to tell people in this, but they're doing this for the sake of transparency. So, so this one tells you that they replaced the trans, that they replaced trans eximic acid with the 2% cetyl tri tri trieximate mesylate, and they say that it's, a, it's an enhanced version of the transeximic acid. Well, is there a study to prove that? Because when I looked, I could find studies for the ingredient, the new ingredient they put in there, but I couldn't find a comparison between the two. So you're still marketing to me saying that this is better when it's supposed to be for the sake of transparency. If it's just transparent, I feel like they should just give the information and not tell me why. Next, they tell you what they replaced the xanthan gum with and which they replaced it with the two other gums. That's fine, but again, what does that tell me? Is there a reason why xanthan gums but like not as good? Was Were these just more ideal? Was it a regulatory issue? They removed disodium EDTA, removed chlorphenicin, they removed PEG-60 hydrogenated castor oil, but Telling a customer this doesn't really 
tell them anything. We don't know why they changed anything other than the active ingredient. So I don't really think that this transparency is really helpful to customers. What I think would be more beneficial to customers and what I think I saw Lush attempt to do was maybe as a brand like The Ordinary or Good Molecules, which is very focused on active ingredients in that aspect, is taking those highlighted ingredients, taking the niacinamide for instance, and putting a study to cite at what percentage this is beneficial educating the customer transparency i think education is more important than transparency for transparency sake basic things to show hey at this percentage it's effective because we have some brands are upping and we're trying to up the concentration we want more and more and more and maybe that concentration isn't really beneficial i think that's more educational and can t help educate customers on what are effective percentages why they don't need more, that kind of thing, over this just here's the information, you go figure out what to do with it. Because we've learned time and time again, telling people to do their own research sometimes isn't actually helpful if you don't know where to research properly. It's very similar to the idea of companies releasing their whole what's in their fragrance. It, you can have that information, but does it really benefit the customer? I think this was a good attempt at transparency from Good Molecules, and I think they are trying to appeal to customers who do want transparency. So please let me know what your thoughts are on this down below, because when I look at this, I see this from my perspective as a chemist, and I see it much differently than maybe the consumer sees it. Do you feel any of the information that they have now provided is helpful. And if you learned something today, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and make sure you subscribe so that way you can learn more about the science behind your makeup and skincare. And with that, I will see you in my next video. Bye!